All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, this week's speaker is Sean Malone. Or I'm sorry, uh, Sean Campbell from Malone University, and he is going to be talking about a recent set of experiments that they were doing uh, with regards to their CC Star deployment on uh, the viability of using virtual data transfer nodes uh, instead of uh, big iron ones like we would see at a larger facility and how this impacts their use case at a small university. So I will turn it over to you, Sean. All right, uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I wanted to just uh, to give a little bit of size and scope. It always is helpful to understand the size of the uh, of our the university. I think, especially related to uh, as it pertains to this project, I wanted to share a little bit about Malone, uh, Malone University. Uh, Malone's an accredited uh, Christian liberal arts university, founded in 1892. Uh, we're on a 96-acre campus in Canton, Ohio. Most people know Canton for the Hall of Fame, uh, the Football Hall of Fame. Uh, we have 47 undergraduate majors, eight pre-professional programs and 10 graduate programs. And we have around 1,700 students. So that 1,700 students kind of gives you an idea of uh, about what our size is. Uh, there's 11 full-time staff in the information technology department. I'm on the infrastructure team. So I just kind of want to get an idea of this, the size and scope of what, uh, what, what my perspective is going to be on this. So I think it will be helpful as I get into the rest of the presentation. So, uh, when I was looking at the project focus for our particular implementation of a DTN here, uh, I looked at what would make sense for me to do um, for the, like, what, what do I want to look at that I think would be interesting, quite interesting questions that, I, that um, uh, you know, things I was curious about, things I thought were worth investigating. Um, I looked at, um, I mean, obviously there's three major things I'd say if you're looking at like a data transfer node and also a, a, with virtualization thrown in the mix. You could look at network performance, you could look at storage performance, or you could look at VM host impact. Um, so what I decided to do for this project, I, I didn't look at storage performance and I didn't look at VM host impact, I focused on network performance. So, so why, why not focus on storage performance or VM host impact? Well, for one thing, our Internet 2 link uh, for our DTN, uh, our Internet 2 link is 500 megabits per second, so it's a relatively slow link for uh, a DTN. But for our purposes and, and uh, for people that would do research here, I mean that's it's a good uh, a good start for us. Um, the other reason I didn't uh, look at doing uh, storage or host impact is I did some initial testing. Um, this is kind of, kind of a new thing for me. I had not done a lot. I've not done anything with WANs before, uh, so I was looking to see. Um, what questions might be interesting? So I did some initial tests to see what kind of uh, what, what kind of questions I might want to answer from the uh, you know to look at for this particular project. And uh, because of the, uh, the the slow link, I I kind of decided to focus on um, the network performance end. Uh, the, I, the other two just didn't seem to make sense. Like uh, it didn't really stress our environment very much. It was it didn't stress us any more than like one of our file servers. You know, due to the uh, the link speed, uh, so I decided to focus on network performance, and I had a couple of different reasons why I did that. Um, I looked at uh, it was my first time optimizing uh, the NIC and the OS stack for a WAN link, so and I found that part very interesting. Uh, I also had interest in the ESNet uh, optimizations. There, uh, they have, ESNet has an extensive site that really is the starting point. If anyone sets up a DTN, I imagine you end up on that page, and it's got a lot of helpful information and some of the optimizations I was familiar with just from, you know, uh, in a production environment, some of them were more specific to uh, you know, a WAN or, um, uh, or a data link with maybe a larger packet size like a jumbo frame or, and so forth. Um, so for me, it was a newer uh, experience, so I was interested in it for that reason. Uh, the other, some of the other reasons, uh, I was looking at validating some of our host design choices, like when we build our VM hosts and uh, our current production environment is going to be reaching its end of life, and I kind of wanted to look and uh, it kind of helped me investigate some of those questions, some of the design choices that we've made because we're going to be replacing our equipment. Uh, the other thing I, I looked at it and I said, which questions are going to be the most useful if I, you know, we're going to share this? Uh, which questions are going to be the most useful to answer? And those going to be which are going to be the most broad? And that's why I kind of stayed away from like storage and host impact because I didn't think that I could really uh, come up with anything all that meaningful. And if I 
did did do something, it would be specific more to our uh, our particular hardware environment, our choice of stand, let's say, in our environment. So those are kind of some of the reasons why I chose to focus on the network performance. Uh, it, it was an area of interest, but there were some other good reasons as well, just because of the the 500 megabit link. So. Uh, so I basically came up with two project goals that I wanted to focus on, and I kind of built them around uh, the ESNet uh, or ESNet performance uh, recommendations. Uh, the first one was I wanted to compare the network performance of a virtual and a physical data transfer node, and I decided I, I looked at the over the ESNet stuff. I did some initial testing. I decided it made sense to use the ESNet recommended WAN optimization to kind of see if I can highlight any differences between a virtual and a physical in terms of performance because, uh, and I kind of, I categorized them, uh, I kind of grouped the, those optimizations in a certain way uh, to try to see if I could um, illuminate any key differences, you know, as I applied the optimization. So that's kind of what, and I'll go into a little more detail about what I did specifically as far as the ESNet uh, recommendations. Uh, the second piece of the puzzle uh, was uh, I wanted to compare the network performance of a shared and a dedicated network interface card in a virtual environment. So those are kind of the two goals that I, I looked at, uh, two things I wanted to investigate and see um, what I might find, you know, as far as uh, is, see what kind of differences or, or unexpected things I might find in those two questions. So I wanted to start off by uh, just kind of going back to the project goal and, uh, and start, we'll focus on the first goal. So the first one was to compare a virtual and physical uh, DTN. And so uh, the physical, I had one physical DTN and one virtual DTN, and the virtual DTN was in our production environment. It wasn't in a test environment. I, I wanted, the point of this was to actually put it in a production environment and see what, you know, I wanted to see what kind of perform, uh, network performance issues I might see or, uh, or see just how it compared with a physical DTN. And uh, again, we had a dedicated link, 500 megabits, and I chose, uh, ESNet has a, a number of servers that you can use uh, for anonymous uh, grid FTP testing that are really fantastic to use. Uh, they give you a wide range of file sizes from one megabit or one megabyte to 500 gigabytes. And uh, I ended up using a 10 gigabyte file for my purposes. So uh, what's nice about the host, they can saturate a link. So I mean, my, obviously my five, the 500 megabit link I was having, I have no issues with that, but it can saturate up to a 10 gigabit link. So if you're doing any sort of serious testing, uh, this is definitely very helpful. Uh, the other thing, initially I was uh, looking at setting up Globus and getting a Globus account and getting it all set up. And Globus was in the midst of kind of changing the way they did things. So I, I was kind of, I hit it a bad time to try and set up Globus because they were changing, they changed all their instructions and they were changing how they were doing things. And I kind of got lost in the weeds on that. And I, I, uh, I ended up finding these SNET test servers because all I, I was concerned about was network performance most for the purpose of this project. So that's why I wanted to, uh, you know, ESNet made it really easy to have one of these servers uh, to use for testing because I didn't have to deal with the authentication piece, the Globus authentication piece, which was really nice. Um, and Globus has servers, or I'm sorry, not Globus, ESNet has servers in California, New York, Chicago, and then one in Switzerland. And I decided to stay within the continental, continental U.S., um, stick with a, uh, I didn't, didn't want to deal with the undersea links. You know, I, for the purpose of the project, I thought picking the furthest link away probably made sense. So I, I went with California for the purpose of the project. And I do provide a link there um, to, if you want to get some information about the DTNs. Uh, one nice thing about ESNet also is if you do have a Globus setup, you want to get a full Globus setup going, they also let you do testing for Globus as, as well. So it's very handy if you're trying to set up a DTN, uh, this, the, the ESNet site and the ESNet resources. So just to kind of, uh, I like to just briefly cover this. Uh, what we ended up doing for the physical DTN is we had a, a VM host from our production environment that we repurposed as a physical DTN for the purpose of the project. Um, the nice thing about a, uh, using a, uh, a, a production VM host, uh, like if it's an older one or whatnot still, uh, is it tends, they tend to be very stable. The hardware in them tends to be very stable because they wouldn't be in service very long if they weren't, and they're designed to be very stable, like in terms of the choices you make. And also, they tend to be really beefy as far as hardware. So it was, I tried to get as close to an apples to apples comparison on hardware as I could in our environment. 
And then uh, I also wanted to just provide some information about our virtual hosts. Um, a couple of things I, um, I used, um, I matched the OSs. I used CentOS 7.5.1804 on both the virtual and the physical DTN. I basically minimized all differences as much as I could as far as the operating system environment. Um, in terms of the virtual DTN, uh, it was hosted in our production environment, and um, I didn't use a dedicated server or anything for that. I, I mean, the point of it was to see if you could run it in our production environment, what kind of effects that might have. Um, the only major, other major difference I would cite would be that the virtual DTN um, was patched for inspector meltdown, but the physical DTN was not. So that was the only other major difference in the configurations for the purpose of the testing that I had as far as a hardware, significant hardware difference. So then I wanted to talk a little bit about, okay, what optimizations did I choose within ESnet that I, I wanted to you know, put in place and, and then take my measurements off of? So for the ESnet optimizations, I, I broke it down into two categories, uh, essentially network interface card optimizations and OS network stack optimization. So what I did is I, I focused, uh, I, I initially looked at measuring some of these as individual parameters, but I actually found it made a lot of sense to group them considering the layer of the operating system in which they're being applied. Uh, the optimizations like for the network card interface uh, or network interface card, like the MTU, you know, I've changed the MTU from 1500 to 8982 uh, for the jumbo frames. Uh, and I also increased the network interface card transmit and receive descriptors from the OS default to the ESnet recommended um, 4096 slash 4096. So essentially, um, a lot of those optimizations were focused in the network card in terms of how it was going to behave, you know, and, and a lot of it was focused on buffering at the hardware level closest to the wire. And then the second uh, batch of ESnet optimizations was focused on the OS network stack. So increasing the TCP buffer sizes, and there's actually a formula, which I believe is on the ESnet site, there's a formula for calculating out your buffer size based on your link. There's actually a nice formula for it. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, the other two optimizations that I had, uh, they recommend changing TCP congestion control from the OS default of cubic to the ESnet recommended HTCP and uh, changing the network queue discipline um, from the OS default of FIFO fast to ESnet recommended FQ. So I made both of those optimizations um, for the, and kind of grouped those together as far as, and, and you'll see that in the next slide, kind of what my methodology was with this. Uh, the last piece, I ended up implementing, um, I used grid FTP, which I found grid FTP to be very interesting. I dealt with FTP, I dealt with SFTP, and of course, if you deal with HTTP, you, you deal with um, you know, multiple streams. You know, that's a pretty common thing in HTTP, but grid FTP was definitely something unique that I found interesting. So I, I, in my testing, I decided um, it, it seemed very compelling to look at the effects of one, two, four, and eight streams, and that's what I decided to do as far as uh, grid FTP, you know, look at the effects of parallel streams. Uh, I figure it would also stress some of the other optimizations and maybe I'd, I'd see what kind of interesting results that I would get from that. And again, I wanted to refer back to ESnet. They have a fantastic tuning guide for tuning your operating system. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's incredibly helpful if you're setting this up. I mean, actually, if you're doing anything on a WAN, these optimizations are useful more than just for a DTN. This is useful for or any sort of action you're doing over a win. So. so I wanted to talk a little bit about the test configurations. Um, as I said, I, I looked at a number of permutations and kind of did some initial tests and experiments. And I ended up coming up with essentially six different uh, configurations. I, I went with the OS default. You know, obviously that was uh, one set. And then I, what I decided to do is incrementally apply certain optimizations. So, I start with the OS defaults, and then um, for the for the first run, then for the second run, I um, I apply network interface card optimizations that I spoke of, like the MTU and the NIC buffers, and then for the uh, then on I add on to that uh, for the the third round, I add on to um, the I add on the network stack optimization. And all through this, I'm using one grid FTP stream. So I start with OS defaults, one grid FTP stream, then I add the NIC optimizations, then I add the OS stack optimizations. And then beyond that, I, I actually increase the number of 
uh, grid FTP streams with the optimizations in place, and I kind of look at that. And I, I thought of all kinds of different ways to permute this, but for what I was trying to measure, I felt this was the cleanest approach. And, and, it, and it was actually very helpful because I was trying to look for any significant difference, and I figured putting these optimizations in place would hopefully trigger that so I could see if I could observe some uh, any sort of differences or anything that might be significant, you know, to tell me how, uh, again, this for a slow link, I wanted to see what, what I could find in terms of uh, in applying these optimizations. So uh, kind of how the test behaved, I wanted to kind of go through that. I essentially wrote a series of of uh, scripts in various programming languages, kind of gluing all this together. Um, but there, there are a couple of important things I wanted to highlight in the test behavior, but I thought I'd just kind of go through the basics of it. Uh, essentially, uh, the test uh, was consisted of applying, you applied the configuration, and what I mean by that is whatever optimizations I was going to apply, or, you know, resetting it back to OS defaults, which I, I did, and I'll talk about that in a moment, like kind of how I cycled through this. But essentially, the steps were I, I was going to apply the configuration, I started a packet capture with TCP dump, and then I started to transfer a 10 gigabyte file from ESNet's uh, California server, and I used the global U Globus URL copy utility, that, that's the utility I used to, to actually uh, facilitate the transfer. And there are a couple of things with, when you're doing measurements, like performance measurements, um, if you're moving a 10 gigabyte file, you, you don't wanna do a complete cap packet capture, you just, Essentially, for the types of analysis I was going to be doing on these packets, I only needed the, the packet headers, really. Uh, I ended up capturing the first 100 bytes of each packet, just to be cautious, but there's a parameter I gave to TCP dump and, you know, cut my file size down uh, to something very manageable and easy to analyze. But also, I didn't need the data. I just needed um, the, the basic header information for my analysis. Uh, the, now, I said before, I, I didn't want to focus on storage performance, so how I handled that is I had the file download into dev null. I kind of did some research, and that seemed to be the least, like, the, the best performing way to actually um, do a, a null download. So I ended up kind of going with that as, uh, and that took, and I did confirm, I did some tests to confirm that did take the disk I.O. out of the equation, and it seemed to work really well. Um, so I was able to isolate and just be, because all I wanted to do was test the network. Uh, the other thing I looked at uh, with Globus, um, if I waited for it to transfer the entire 10 gig file, you know, that would take quite a bit of time. And what I looked at is I wanted to figure out, okay, when do I hit peak in terms of my transfer speed? When do I hit my peak transfer speed? And so I did some initial tests, a whole series of tests, uh, so eventually automated some of them just to confirm it. But I found that um, two minutes, it takes about, uh, because of um, TCP's uh, slow start, it takes about two minutes um, to hit optimal transfer, and that's what I found. So I, again, I, so I limited the TCP dump to 100 packets in the header, and then with global, Globus URL copy, I limited, to, limited it to a two, minute, um, two minutes of the transfer, and that's kind of how I did it, uh, rather than letting the transfer go all the way to the end. Um, it, it, for what I was trying to measure, that was all I really needed. Uh, so, and what I would do is I, I, I collected the transfer rates, uh, grid FTP, you can, there's an option you can feed it where it'll collect the transfer rates for you, and I had it collect the transfer rates into a file, and then I, I wrote a utility to kind of go through that file and, and uh, extract the uh, transfer rate information. And uh, I would collect 10 samples for each configuration, so for the OS defaults, I would do, you know, 10 samples, and then as it, for each configuration, I, I did 10 samples, essentially. Uh, I did all the tests within a 24-hour period. I did the vertical, vertical or I'm sorry, virtual data transfer nodes first, and then I, or the virtual data transfer node first, and then I did the physical data transfer node after that. Now, one thing I thought about afterwards was I kind of would have liked to have synchronized them to have them alternate. I think that would have been a better methodology to follow. It would have been a little more sophisticated programming, um, but uh, I thought about that afterwards. Uh, one thing that I did do um, is to avoid sam some sample bias, because I, I ran this over a certain, like I said, within a 24-hour period, um, what I did was um, each sample would cycle through all six configurations and start the next sample run. Because what I didn't want to do is, is, okay, I was doing 10 samples, but I didn't want to do all 10 samples for a particular configuration and then do the next 10 and the next 10, because I thought, I was concerned that I would get bias, that I'd pick up more bias from just the time of day, the particular circumstances of the link, and so what I did is I would, I would have it alternate. 
And that's where I, I kind of get into this pattern. I apply the configuration, I start the capture, I start the file transfer, and then I apply the next configuration. And I essentially cycle through those six configurations until I collect uh, 10 samples or a total of, uh, for each one or a total of 60 samples. And so that's kind of the pattern that I followed, my way of kind of uh, looking at, okay, how can I minimize, uh, make sure I'm measuring something that's going to be, you know, very, going to be useful and giving me what I want to know. So I thought I'd put the results up of uh, kind of what I measured and kind of talk a little bit about each thing that I measured. Uh, essentially what the chart shows that, you know, the virtual and the physical DTN, and then I show which of the, uh, like which configuration options applied, you know, in which scenario. And then I have measurements in terms of the transfer rates. I, I took some of the uh, transfer rate information. I also like to look, the thing I found interesting when I applied the, uh, the MTU, uh, the large uh, for jumbo frames, uh, just how much it cuts the number of packets down. It's it's a phenomenal improvement, which is very logical. But uh, for me, I, I'd never really thought about that before, just how big of a difference it makes. But it definitely shows up in the transfer rates. Uh, as you can see, as I apply more and more of the ESNet optimizations, I get significantly improved performance. So um, now, in terms of how I did my analysis, like I said, I collected the grid FTP information for the for the uh, the min, max, and average transfer rates. I got that from uh, grid FTP. But then for the remaining two, remaining three, I used Wireshark to grab those. So the packet total that's pretty easy to do in Wireshark. Now, one nice thing that Wire, Wireshark has is it has special filters. If you're going to do TCP analysis, like an an, or I'm sorry, analysis on TCP. It has a filter for lost segments, and it has a filter for retransmissions. And it was very helpful because it made it very easy for me to calculate my, my packet loss percentages and my retransmit percentages and see what kind of interesting items I might find in there. Um, one thing I did want to point out in these results for the physical DTN is there was, a, I believe, there must have been a bug, like some interaction between the network card driver and the TCP dump, like the library that TCP dump uses for packet capture. Uh, I had some anomalies where I would get packet, like in the packet capture file, I had packets that were impossible sizes. Um, and so there was definitely, uh, at least in the initial, initial uh, two tests that I did on it, I noticed some anomalies. But then it's interesting because the rest of the time it seemed to most, it mostly cleared up. I, I didn't see anything strange beyond that. But it, I did notice some anomalies that, uh, and if, if I were to do this again, I probably would um, use multiple physical DTNs. I mean, with a virtual environment, it's easy to move it to another host, but I would have probably wanted to add another, at least one more physical DTN in just to eliminate these kinds of little issues that you run into. So that, that was kind of unexpected. So, um, so let's see where I want to go to next here. I do that. Oh, okay. No, I am on the right spot. So, in terms of my results, um, uh, one thing that I did find that I, I wanted to present, actually mentioned in an earlier uh, slide, when I first set this up, I said, okay, jumbo frame MTU 9000. Well, I did some tests over the uh, Internet 2 link, and the packets wouldn't get very far. They would only get over a couple of routers, and then they would they would just disappear. Um, and so I talked to our senior network engineer about it, and there must be some additional overhead, perhaps in how our, you know, ISPs or someone out there that I wasn't able to get the full 9,000. I actually had to use an MTU of 8982. So was, at first, when I was first testing, I thought, okay, why isn't this working? And I started to do uh, some, some more results. So it was definitely a learning experience for me because this is different than implementing jumbo frames if you just do it on your LAN. You do have some issues and things, but this was definitely a unique item. So I ended up just setting it lower and lower until I finally found the size that uh, that seemed to work, and it wouldn't let me go any larger than that. Um, but as far as my uh, my test results, um, as I showed, if you looked at the previous uh, chart, the ESNet optimizations deliver a significant improvement. So definitely worthwhile, very helpful. They have it all figured out. You don't need to go and figure it out yourself or do any go to a forum. It's right there on their website. It's fantastic information. Works worked very well for me. Um, let's see. Um, 
I, I was interested. It was interesting to me that um, the packet loss percentages, um, like when I would apply the MTU optimizations, uh, specifically, I think it was the MTU that did this because it decreased the number of packets. I noticed that the packet loss rate went up just a little bit. So if the packet loss rate was 0.0172% when I just did OS defaults, when I had those ESNet NIC optimizations, it was 0.0184%. And so it was a little bit higher, but the transfer rates were still much better. And the overall amount of data loss and everything, it was, it was just very interesting to see some of these results and to think of just how, how, big, how, how big of a reduction in the number of packets. I mean, I just kind of got, I don't do a lot of work here with the, the larger MTUs, so it was kind of uh, an adventure for me, you know, in all of this. And, and we're looking at using, uh, at some point, doing, doing some work with jumbo frames on our LAN as well. Uh, at this point, we've only done some experimentation. Um, the other thing, though, through all this, when I looked at the, when I looked over the data and kind of compared apples to apples, I really didn't see, uh, aside from the anomalies, which I was able to go into the data in specifically like the Wireshark captures, and I was able to see that there definitely was some strangeness going on with it. Um, it, it actually kind of proved out that at least for a 500 megabit per second link, which is again a pretty slow link, but for a small university like us, that, that's the size of Internet 2 connection that we have. Uh, a virtual DTN is, has no problems. It, it, uh, I didn't see any statistically significant difference between the performance of a physical and a virtual DTN. Um, I would like to have pushed it up to like a gigabit or, or even a little further than that just to see what kind of result. But uh, for the purposes of the test and, and what we had, it, it, uh, it just confirms, it confirms how good the ESNet optimizations and recommendations are. And that uh, at least for the lower lower performance DTNs, uh, you know, if you're not doing a 10 gig one, it's uh, it's actually uh, it seems to look the results are pretty good. So I'm going to so, jump in really quick because uh, somebody has a question, Sean. Uh, were were the sure. tests that you were doing were those uh, download or were you doing upload tests as well? Oh no, no yes, excellent question. Um, again, because the ESNet is, the ESNet servers are read only, so. All of my tests on the WAN were read-only. So, so it was always me downloading from California. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, let's see. Uh, testing anomalies. I talked a little bit about uh, some of the test anomalies, or anomalies already. So let me, uh, let's see if I had anything. Oh. Uh, Skipped ahead there too much. So I'll come back to uh, the second project goal. And this one particularly interested me because uh, one of the issues you have with in virtual environments uh, when you're building hosts, and this is something I've seen on a, a couple of lists, a lot of people, uh, especially in higher education, you know, with VMware you pay per CPU. So a lot of times you buy a, uh, you know, you, you could just buy one CPU instead of two. And it actually saves you some money on maintenance and licensing costs, and, and there might be other vendors as well that this applies for. Microsoft had applied as well, and though they're changing that this fall. Um, but one of the things that people forget about, you can have all 24 processor cores on a chip now, but um, like if you have PCI Express 2, uh, you have... Um, you only have so much bandwidth in the PCI Express root complex. That's essentially what uh, all the hardware devices that are gonna interact with main memory in the CPU all have to go through the root complex. And so you can load that, your server up with all these cards, HBAs and, and all, you know, GPU accelerators, all these different things that you can put into it, uh, network cards. Um, but if you have to be careful because uh, Intel uh, CPUs only have, uh, 32 uh, PCI Express lanes, and you can run, you can actually have a situation where you're oversubscribed, where you, the root complex can't provide enough bandwidth if all of your devices really push it. And in, even if you're not, um, they call it line rate, even if you're not line, uh, you're a little under line rate on it, you can, you can have performance issues and responsiveness issues uh, without even getting, just when you get close to the maximum bandwidth of your root complex. So. Um, I was kind of interested in uh, comparing, uh, this kind of led me into thinking about uh, what would a shared NIC versus a dedicated NIC, is there any sort of difference that I could measure out of this? And 
And with this, I, I wasn't going to use a WAN link to uh, measure it. I, I ended up using a, a simulated WAN link, which I'll talk about here in a moment. But I, I particularly, I really get interested in the design of virtual hosts for high performance uh, because, like, if you have a dual CPU server and you only put one CPU in, you only get 32 PCI Express lanes. But if you put two of them in, then you get double that. You get 64. Uh, this is less of a concern with, like, AMD processors, but it's, um, it's really interesting to, just when you're designing servers, like uh, virtual servers, you get into all these limits that you really have never had to pay attention to in uh, physical servers in, in a lot of cases. Um, so shared versus dedicated NIC, you know, why, why should I, uh, why should we look at that? Why is it interesting? Well, if you're going to implement this in an environment, especially at a small university, you probably have multiple NIC cards. You, you might have your DMZ traffic and your intranet going on the same one. You might have that separated, but, um, you know, there, or you may have your, um, but essentially you're going to have different types of traffic potentially sharing network cards just uh, for high availability, for failover, in case a NIC fails, you don't want to lose your entire intranet or DMZ. Uh, it depends on your design choices, though. If you have a lot of hosts, there's other ways of, of mitigating some of this in your design. But for us, we have a small number of hosts, a smaller environment. So, uh, but it is more common than you know, to have a shared NIC. Uh, so, um, let's get into the the network. What did the network look like for the purpose of kind of testing this and, and kicking the tires on it? Well, uh, I wanted to say first before I, I go any further, um, I, did, I got into uh, my boss, Adam Clem, and he put me in touch with someone, uh, a, a Dr. Jorge uh, Crichigno. Uh, Crichigno? Yeah. He's the associate professor at the College of Engineering and Computing at the University of uh, South Carolina. And uh, he and one of his graduate students, they took some time with me and we did kind of a, uh, a video conference and he kind of showed me some things. I had some questions about measuring performance in Linux and, and I told him what some of the things I, I was thinking of doing and what I, what I wanted to try to compare. And he kind of, he showed me some of the tools like I'm using the NetEM queuing discipline in Linux. Uh, Linux is kind of the Swiss army knife when it comes to doing this types of research. And so uh, it has a specific queuing discipline that lets you simulate WAN latency, packet loss, retransmissions, uh, packet corruption. It, it, it's kind of a toolbox uh, for that sort of thing. In addition to that, um, he kind of gave me some uh, pointers on iPerf3 as well and kind of showed me, uh, I told him kind of what I was trying to do, and he was doing something a little bit different, but uh, he was able to give me some uh, real insight into how to use these tools and design this, uh, this particular experiment. So I really appreciate uh, his input on that. Uh, and Tim taking the time. So, uh, and then, uh, I, so to start with here, uh, essentially I have uh, one reference DTN, which I ended up uh, using a uh, different server for this. Uh, I, I tried it, I went with a different server, a little different model for this uh, to compare for my reference DTN. And I had one virtual DTN, which I just pretty much reused the one that I had. And then I had a Linux physical router. So, the NetEM is actually, you implement it on the router. That's, that's the one requirement that Net, the NetEM queuing discipline has. If you want to introduce artificial latency, it has to cross a router. So I had to put a Linux router in the middle of it, and I just took a, a Linux server uh, that you know, had sufficient performance, and I went ahead and put it in place here. And you actually put the NetEM in place on that router. So and that's just the way the, the, uh, the NetEM queuing discipline works. So I basically put that router in between my virtual and my reference DTN. Um, and then I uh, directly connected them and you know, via the router, you know, I kind of chained them together. And then I set up, you know, latencies, uh, you know, simulated latency between the two, between the router and the two locations. And essentially I didn't try to introduce any packet loss or corruption. I, I only looked at, uh, I wanted to see kind of, uh, kind of like racing a car. I wanted to see you know, all things being equal, what what kind of difference might I see between these two? What, you know, would I see any significant difference between a shared versus a dedicated NIC? You know, and, and what's nice about this is I could actually push the network card. Now, it was only a gig, they're only gigabit network cards, but I still, I, I was able to push it harder than I could with the WAN link and see if I could, you know, get any sort of result, uh, you know, interesting results with that. So what I ended up doing, um, 
I used iPerf3 for the network performance tests. I did kind of a similar series. Uh, iPerf3 lets you do multiple streams, much the way Globus, uh, Globus is, um, or I'm sorry, GridFTP's tools do as well. So I, I was able to use iPerf3 with multiple streams, and I did one, two, four, and eight, kind of a similar test to what I had done before. Um, Essentially, the test consisted of 60-second iperf 3 TCP transfers where the first 10 seconds of, were, were ignored. So that was the one nice thing about iperf 3 and this is something that was very helpful um, when I was working with, um, with uh, Jorge. Uh, he, he had showed there were some options to you know, basically knock this out, like in the first 10 seconds. You can have it uh, essentially ignore, take out that slow start that's just going to throw off your numbers and throw off what you're trying to measure. So I mean, iperf 3 is—it's built for for ex exactly what what I'm using it for here, uh, and it has all kinds of options to kind of chop out that TCP slow start, and you can get you know get the actual uh, you know, tr speed the transfer results from it. Um, so I basically used it to gather average sender and receiver throughput measurements, and that's what I ended up putting in here. Uh, I also looked at um, packet loss percentage, which again with with no packet loss in the link, it would come down to whatever our hardware is, which there should be zero packets lost, and there were. But the retransmits, I, I, I recorded those because I thought they might be interesting. So, uh, so like I did, I, like I said, I usually what I would do is I put all this together, I do some initial tests, see what I think might be interesting, and then kind of build uh, what I want to measure, and then set it up and automate it to actually measure it. Um, and what I found though in this. You know, when comparing these two, it was shared in a dedicated NIC, uh, and this is a gigabit NIC, so I mean, if I had a 10 gig, I would have tested that, but we had a gigabit here. I didn't see anything that was statistically significant on this part of it, which was kind of a disappointment because I'd, I'd hoped for something, but it also kind of validated my suspicions because uh, when we designed the host, it had, um, I had paid attention to the root complex, so I didn't really expect to see any sort of major performance differences between them. And if it was, it would be something related to the virtual host operating system itself more likely than the hardware. So, uh, but it's always possible you could have some kind of bug in the hardware too, but I didn't find anything statistically significant in this. So whether you're using a shared NIC or a dedicated NIC, at least at gigabit levels, it didn't, it didn't make any difference. Now, one thing, if I would have went up to like a 10 gig NIC, uh, there's all kinds of optimizations and things you can get into and in, in actually optimizing the guest host operating system. And I looked at some of those and kind of tinkered with some of those a little bit, as much as I can within our production environment. And actually, I did it, I think, more, uh, investigated a little more thoroughly in our test environment. But uh, I didn't really find anything that I thought would be worth investigating at the speeds that I was going to be doing the experiments on. So I was actually more hopeful I'd find something here, but it didn't pan out. So. So it doesn't. So that's one thing. I mean, you come down to really, if you're going to separate links, I mean, the only other thing I could think of is if there's some sort of security reason uh, why you have to have it separated. You know, it doesn't. It seems like the shared link, at least for these speeds, doesn't seem to have uh, any effect on that. Whether you whether you use a dedicated or a shared. And um, so I wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, ESnet uh, for all their hard work because I was able to. Uh, things that would have taken me a long time to dig out of forums and Linux kernel mailing lists, they have it all right on their website. They have a great tuning guide. Uh, they have a, a performance testing guide. And then if you are building physical servers, they have a lot of server hardware design uh, resources. A lot of, uh, they get into the real guts of every subsystem, storage subsystem, all kinds of hardware level optimizations, operating system level optimizations to go beyond what I was doing. And and even so a lot of this stuff, it's, it's useful to go out and look at it if you build virtual hosts because it, it gets you to think about a lot of other optimizations and things that get considerations you might make when you're designing the actual hardware or even what to look for if you're using VMware, what to look for in the, in the host operating system that might help you uh, improve performance for your production environment, maybe not even related to uh, science per se, but just for gen general production environment. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was a couple of things I came across when I was starting to get into this DTN. Like, what was the hardest part? What was the part that really caused you to stumble? And I don't want to say give up, but was the most frustrating or 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 something that just maybe a suggestion that of some a part of the process that might be made easier. Uh, one idea that I had was um, if you want a small university to participate, uh, 
it's it, it'd be kind of nice if there was an OVA that was pre-built with a lot of this set up. And maybe there is something. I, I didn't come across one, but I, I thought that would be kind of nice because if you're a small school and you want to participate in the research community, um, and maybe if you're not dedicated to it or, or you, it's not even a port, it's kind of something you're getting tacked on to you, it's, it's kind of nice if, if you had a resource like that because you could quickly get a, a DTN set up with the right software with all the optimizations in place and it'd be kind of convenient. So that was one idea I had was a way to, to help small universities out. The other big one, which for me, I, I think would be, uh, I, like I said, the Globus was in the midst of changing how they get connected. Like uh, they had these nice instructions that didn't look too bad and I started to set them up and I got to a certain point and I got some unusual error message and I dug through forums and I found that uh, I was referring to old documentation and it had just changed when I started to do it, I think, or, or it had not changed that all that long ago. And there was a new process and, and I started to set that up and then I ended up finding the anonymous uh, grid FTP servers at ESNet and I decided to go that route instead. Um, but I think sim simplifying the Globus installation and setup, which uh, it looks like there's some progress towards that because that, that's why they were changing it. But the piece that really kind of I stumbled on is the uh, integrated authentication. Like if we want our users to authenticate using our own uh, credentials, our own system, getting that set up seemed a little more complicated. I mean, we use SAML here for a lot of our web stuff. Uh, we use LDAP authentication otherwise. And the LDAP authentication required, I think, uh, user certificates and some other things which we've never set up before. So that was one thing I looked at and I thought, well, this is an area where if you want small universities with more limited resources where they don't have an assigned staff person to this, it's kind of maybe something else that they are adding on. Or even if they do have a partial, some partial support there, uh, it's definitely, I think, a stumbling block. I, so I just was thinking about, okay, what would have made my job easy? I, I would say if I had a virtual TTN and a simplified Globus setup to let me integrate, you know, our authentication here, that would have been handy, you know, something like that. So that was just an observation I made. Those were kind of my two areas as I looked through this process. I looked at, okay, what was hard, what was easy. And so I wanted to just bring that up. So, and then are there any other questions uh, about any, any of the? Well, um, thanks a lot uh, for going through all that, Sean. Uh, so uh, if anybody does have questions, please just type them into the chat room and I can read them out. Uh, looks like we have one from Dory. Uh, I have a non-network engineer question. Why are you using an MTU of 8982? Uh, they use 9000 for jumbo frames, but I'm curious what the difference is, uh, why, you, why you chose that. I think I know the answer, but I'll let you explain it, Sean. Uh, yes, uh, essentially, internally, that, that, was, that was what puzzled me initially, is I set an MTU of 9000. That's what you would do on jumbo frames on a LAN. And so when I first started testing this, I went right right to that, and I start, I would I could but I trace routed, and I, the packet would only get so far out on the internet. So when I tried to set up that link to go out to California to that ESnet server in California, um, the packet was only getting a couple of routers. It actually wasn't making it out of our ISP, one of our ISPs uh, networks. And um, I talked to our senior network engineer about it, and apparently there's some additional overhead just the way they. Um, you don't get the full 9,000 on the packets because they're they're putting them inside of, um, I don't think it's MPLS, but they're basically putting in, just the way the ISP manages its network, uh, they, they, they were, we were losing some bytes from uh, our MTU to that optimization. So the maximum size packet I could send from here to California was 8982. And I that was through trial and error. I just basically, uh, once I, I talked to the network engineer about it and, and we worked through it a little bit, then I just went down and just kept, kept decreasing the MTU until it went through. And so um, the, it just has to do with how the uh, how the packets flow through the internet that you apparently can't always do a full size MTU. And, and I don't know if that's just specific to, well, I don't think it's just specific to our ISP necessarily, but um, yeah, it was an issue that I came across, but it can be frustrating if you're trying to follow a series of directions, you're like, okay, you get just some of the basics in place and you're like, okay, what's going on? And it, it didn't occur to me to, to do that right away. That's why I went to the senior network engineer. And But no, that's why I had to go with an MTU. I couldn't get it to actually transfer over the internet. So at the full size, at the jumbo frame size. So, so which ISP is this? Is this an ORNET problem or is this somebody else? 
I don't know if it. I don't know if it was. I'm trying to remember if it was. It got it got into our ISP's network, but then there was a certain point where I think it was going to transfer between the, the, maybe that ISP and another one. I I, I I can't remember clearly now, but it essentially it was at a transfer point because uh, it did make it into our ISP's network, but it only got through so many routers, and then it it got stopped by one of them. And uh, it just, it, it didn't allow, the link didn't allow an MTU that large, so. Yeah, well, so if, if you guys are interested, I can certainly uh, help mediate if uh, you'd like to see that fixed, because in theory, that should not happen. They shouldn't just drop them on the floor. They should either fragment the packet or add the extra eight bytes so that you don't have that as an issue. Um, you know, this this is usually what we like to call the off by one error. Uh, somebody didn't configure the, the interface and the VLAN uh, structure for your connection to be large enough. And it's, a, it's an easy fix. Somebody just has to physically do it. So you, we could follow oh, up offline okay. on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, I'd want to, if I was going to deal with that, I'd want to deal through the senior network or talk to our senior network engineer about that first. But I, no, I do appreciate the offer on that though. Yeah, and uh, Andy also uh, threw some information to the chat. You know, it, it, uh, that's what I was thinking too, Andy. This looks like Q and Q. Um, so yeah, this would be yeah. something that if we yeah, if we wanted to work it. on this with okay, if we wanted to work on this yeah. with uh, your engineer uh, resource on on the Malone and the Ornet end, we can certainly do that. Well, see, our network we have a we're using Q and Q for our uh, disaster recovery site to to basically have a a secure network. Our uh, you'll get to get over to our disaster recovery site. So I don't know how that complicates everything. So that's why I don't know if I want to mess with it. I, I talked to the senior network engineer about it because it's, it's 18 bytes. <laughs> it's not that much. But. Yeah, certainly. All right, so if anybody else has any other questions, please type them in. I had a, a couple that I jotted down here as you were going through. Uh, so I, you may have said it, um, but when you were doing the, the dedicated and shared NIC testing, um, what, what, were there any other sort of virtual machines running in the background uh, to sort of create uh, quote unquote noise for the system or uh, were you sort of yeah, running it yeah. on a, an unladen? Okay. No, everything was done. Like the, the point of this, I wanted to see, you know, cause if you run it on a clean system, you might get good results. But yeah, I ran it on our production system for both the first, the first project goal and the second project goal. So. Okay. And uh, now that you've sort of uh, sorted out some of the, the differences between Grid FTP and Globus, do you have any uh, uh, thoughts about running this again with sort of the, the new Globus infrastructure, or uh, you don't, do you think that that wouldn't cause any any additional complications for, for the results that you saw? Uh, the only thing, that, like someone had mentioned about, the only thing I, I would have liked to have seen is I only did a receive test. I didn't do a transmit. I would like to have seen I would like to have done a two-way test. That's what I was going for, is I was going to do both ways. But I struggled so much with the Globus, and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to go with the – and I talked to a couple people, and I just – I finally kind of gave up on it. And I went with uh, – because they were, they were in the middle of, of redoing, reworking all their instructions and everything. I figured, you know, if I were to go out and do it today, you know, the documentation, all that's all sorted out. I mean, they had all the pieces. They had, like, pages pointing to the right places and everything. But, I mean, they were in the midst of changing it all around. So. Um, and I did sign up for it and sign up for account. I tried to work through some of the stuff, but I, I kind of gave up on it when I found the anonymous servers. I decided to just cut out the transmit piece, but that's, that's something I would do, uh, if I were to redo it again today. So, but. All right. And my last question was now that you sort of had the results from this, have you tried to integrate, um, uh, this DTN into any of your researchers workflows yet? Well, we had, we have a computational, uh, chemist that came and we I think uh, my boss had talked to him a little bit about some things but I don't I don't know that we have like for for the purpose of the, the we just had the NSF grant that we just uh, finished up um, the re all the researchers that we had none of them had requirements for DTN they had they did have a need for data and analysis capabilities but they were not uh, they weren't related to uh, needing to move large amounts of data so uh, they were more just being what Anna, like w more of what we did during the grant was using uh, computer science students and also using um, using them, uh, pairing them up with faculty and essentially building tools to allow faculty to greatly increase the scope of their research beyond what they, they, they were able to do themselves. And a lot of it had to do with 
they needed to be able to manipulate large amounts of data and they're doing it in Excel or SPSS or some tool, but I mean the tool is limited where you put a programmer on task with it. So that's kind of where in terms of our faculty needs, we didn't have anyone that we found uh, that needed uh, moving large amounts of data as far as a project. We have one person that we're still uh, kind of waiting to see about that, see if that, this is something they would want to do. But most of the time it's 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 been uh, the need for data analysis, being able to deal with large, like big data essentially, to increase the scope of your project, so. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat room, so I'll, I'll thank you again. Uh, really great talk. Uh, just remember to send me the, the slides and I'll make sure that that gets posted. And okay. for everybody who's still on, uh, next week's talk is gonna be Nick Baraglio from ESNet, and he's gonna be doing, um, I think, SDN topics. Uh, and I'll send out the announcement on the mailing list about that uh, next week. So hope everybody has a good weekend. Uh, thanks again, Sean, and we'll talk to you all soon. Yep, talk to you soon. Bye.